everybody, Jade here. Today's video is about one of the most famous paradoxes in mathematical history. It's called Russell's Paradox, named after Bertrand Russell, super cool dude, um, very influential philosopher slash mathematician slash logician slash social activist slash Nobel Prize winner. So yeah, we'll get to know all about him. But this is probably one of my favorite paradoxes, and it's really one of those ones that just makes you really question everything, you know, question everything you know. So yeah, I'm super excited for this video. Just before we get into it, I just want to say that this is a f probably the most nuanced video I've ever done. There's a lot of subtleties and there's a lot of philosophy. So if you find that you're getting a bit lost or you need to like rewind or watch the video again, that's totally normal. And I'd actually be pretty surprised if you got everything the first time. So yeah, let's get right into it. So first I'm going to introduce you to a somewhat simpler version of the paradox, just to soften some of the concepts that we're going to talk about later on. So this one is called the barber paradox, and it goes like this. There is a town with one barber, and his task is to shave all and only those who do not shave themselves. Now the question is, does the barber shave himself? Think about it. If the barber does not shave himself, then he should. And if he does shave himself, then he shouldn't. So? So keep this little riddle at the back of your mind throughout the rest of the video. But now let's get right into the math. So Russell's paradox is ultimately about the foundation of mathematics. But some of you might be unfamiliar with that concept. What is a foundation of mathematics? Well, let's draw an analogy with the other sciences. The sciences are kind of like a tree. Biology is the study of living organisms, which are the result of millions and millions of chemical interactions. So one could conclude that all branches of biology stem from chemistry, or that chemistry is in some way foundational to biology. Likewise, chemical reactions are ultimately physical interactions, so one could conclude that all branches of chemistry stem from physics. If we keep going down in this way, we'll eventually come to the elementary particles that make up our universe, electrons and quarks. The laws that govern these particles can be considered the foundations of science, in that the rest of the sciences stem from them. If we were to discover something completely new about them, it would somewhat affect our understanding of the other sciences, even if only at the theoretical level. In the 19th century, each branch of math was pretty disconnected from the other branches, and there was no unifying trunk. Mathematicians at the time wanted to unify the branches of mathematics, and therefore a foundational theory was needed. But what made it tricky is that the approach to figure out the foundations of math is very different to that of the other sciences. We learn about the other sciences by observing the outside world, whether it be watching cells under a microscope, measuring orbits through a telescope, or smashing particles together at insanely high speeds. But we can't really learn more about mathematics by observing the outside world. Math seems to be something that just is. We can imagine a universe where the fundamental building blocks are different, or where time goes backwards, or where everything was made of antimatter. But we can't really imagine a universe where 2 plus 2 equals 5. Math is different in that it seems to be true by definition, and even though it's very good at describing our universe, it doesn't seem to be about our universe. Why? That is the question at the heart of this paradox. Now it's here that we steer away from the harder sciences and head more toward the study of what reality really is. Philosophy. We come to the first character in our story. The question, why is math the way it is, captured one of the greatest philosophical minds of all time, Plato. Plato thought that mathematical objects, numbers, shapes, and the relationships between them were objective truths. That is, objects that existed independently of us and our world. He thought they existed in their own world, which he called the world of forms. But one of Plato's pupils, Aristotle, had his own views. Unlike Plato, he thought that numbers themselves weren't objects, but properties of objects. For example, if there were four cows in a field, it wasn't that cows were an object and four was also an object, but the number four was a property of the collection of cows. 
He also thought they didn't exist in their own world of forms independent of our world, but they described features of our world and so belonged to our world. Another colourful philosopher, Immanuel Kant, soon came along, and he didn't like the view that mathematical objects were objective truths, and believed that to understand the basic principles of math, you needed some kind of intuition. That yes, math described our world, but we also brought it to the world from our experience. Now this is where our quiet hero of the story comes along, Gottlob Frege. Yes, interestingly, Bertrand Russell is not the main player in Russell's paradox, but a German mathematician named Frege. The story of Frege is somewhat tragic as he was largely ignored during his life and 20 years of his life's work was unjustly washed down the drain, but here he will be remembered as a god among us. Frege disagreed with Aristotle's view that numbers were properties of objects because of this argument. If numbers are properties of object, then only one number should belong to any object, and it shouldn't be influenced by matter of opinion. But then, imagine a pair of shoes. Is it one pair of shoes, or is it two shoes? Depending on how we conceptualize an object, the number belonging to it changes. Again, imagine a deck of cards. Depending on how we conceptualize it, it could be one deck of cards, or 52 cards. So Frege concluded that numbers don't apply to objects, but to concepts. He also disagreed with Kant that to understand math you needed intuition and experience, stating that the laws of arithmetic can be known from the basis of reason alone. I sought to make it plausible that arithmetic is a branch of logic and need not borrow any ground of proof whatever from either experience or intuition. Frege's main goal was to reduce mathematics to logic and show that logic is in fact the foundation of math. This idea is known as logicism. Now the notion of logic that Frege had in mind is pretty similar to how we would use it in everyday language. But just to make it super clear, logic is a tool for reasoning about how different statements affect each other through nothing more than deduction and inference. For example, if we take it as a fact that all dogs have a good sense of smell and Tiffa is a dog, deductive reasoning will tell you that Tiffa has a good sense of smell. I don't know if this is the best example though because she's pretty old. I don't know if she can smell much anymore. But you get the idea. Frege started his quest of reducing math to logic by coming up with a definition of what number was. Now this might seem like a somewhat trivial question to some of you, what is a number? But remember at the heart of Frege's paradox was the idea that you don't need any kind of intuition or experience to understand mathematics. And when you think about it, have you ever actually tried to describe what a number is without using the word number or words derived from the word number? I've spent some time trying as I was writing this video and I found that I always ended up using the word number again or a word that was directly related to number like amount or quantity. Give it a go right now and let me know what you come up with in the comments. Frege defined numbers by using this idea of concepts and extensions. A concept is pretty much any idea you can think of. The colour red, sheep, Bill and Bob, Shakespeare's plays, hipsters, elephants with no ears, literally any idea. And an extension is the set of all things that fall under that concept. For the concept the colour red, its extension would be the set of all red things, past, present and future. The concept Bill and Bob would be made of the extension of the Bill and Bob you were referring to. If we have a concept like square circles, which doesn't make sense, their extension would simply be the empty set, a set with nothing in it. Numbers, Frege stated, are extensions of concepts. For example, the number 4 is the extension of the concept of all things made up of a collection of this many objects. The number 7 is the extension of the concept of all things made up of a collection of this many objects. Frege built his foundation of mathematics from the axiom that all concepts we can possibly think of have a corresponding extension, and therefore there are as many extensions as there are concepts. He named this the general comprehension principle. And it sounds reasonable, right? Can you think of a concept that doesn't have a corresponding set to go with it? I don't think I could but Bertrand Russell did. Frege was just about to have his work printed when he received a letter from Bertrand Russell in June 1901, which read along the lines of, 
Dear colleague, I find myself in complete agreement with you in all essentials. In regard to many particular questions, I find in your work discussion, distinctions, and definitions that one seeks in vain in the works of other logicians. There is just one point where I have encountered a difficulty. Consider the set of all sets that are not members of themselves. Is that set a member of itself? This simple question shattered Frege's foundation and caused him a mental breakdown so severe he ended up in hospital, and later caused him to write, My efforts to throw light on the question surrounding the word number seems to have ended in complete failure. Let's break it down. First, a word about sets. Sets are a collection of things. You can even have sets within sets. Take for example the set of all sets of bird species. There exists the set of all penguins, the set of all seagulls, the set of all pigeons, and the set of all other bird species, and they themselves would make up the set of all sets of bird species. Most sets are not members of themselves, that is, they don't fall under themselves. For example, the set of all teapots is not a teapot, the set of all turtles is not a turtle. But what about the set of all things that are not turtles? Because it's a set and not a turtle, it is a member of the set of all things that are not turtles. Therefore, the set of all things that are not turtles is a member of itself. A lot of sets are members of themselves, and there's nothing too extraordinary about that. But the question that Russell asked was, is the set of all sets that are not members of themselves a member of itself? Think about it. If it is a member of itself, then it is not. And if it's not a member of itself, it is. Sound familiar? I'll say it again. If it is a member of itself, then it's not. And if it's not a member of itself, it is. Now the reason that this was so catastrophic is because the last thing you want in a neat, systematized, axiomatized description of anything is a contradiction. Imagine if one of the foundational laws of physics predicted that gravity both always pulls and always pushes. It'd be a pretty useless law. When your system is able to derive two opposite theorems, this puts into question the entire theory. Numerous attempts were made to correct this hiccup, like Russell's theory of types which tried to put sets into some kind of hierarchy. But many thought that this fix was too artificial and ad hoc. Frege eventually felt forced to abandon many of his views about logic and math. Even so, as Russell points out, Frege met the news of the paradox with remarkable fortitude. As I think about acts of integrity and grace, I realize that there is nothing in my knowledge to compare with Frege's dedication to truth. His entire life's work was on the verge of completion. Much of his work had been ignored to the benefit of men infinitely less capable. His second volume was about to be published, and upon finding that his fundamental assumption was an error, he responded with intellectual pleasure, clearly submerging any feelings of personal disappointment. It was almost superhuman and a telling indication of that of which men are capable, if their dedication is to creative work and knowledge instead of cruder efforts to dominate and be known. Apparently he didn't know about the breakdown. Anyway, after a series of fortunate events, the foundations of mathematics is now known to be a system called zamello frankel set theory, which has a lot of Frege's original ideas incorporated into it. But although this is currently the most widely accepted theory, the search still isn't over, with candidates like category theory and homotopy type theory becoming serious contenders for that much desired position at the bottom of the math tree. But that is for another video.